Can you say hello to John this morning? Can you say hello? Huh? This is what I want you to. I, this is what I want you to say. There you go. I want you to tell them. Would you not love to come and hang out with me? On in preschool. That's what you ought to be saying to these folks. That's right. That's exactly what you need to be asking them. Because today is our ministry fair. And part of the area of ministry needs we have in our church, as there are plenty of them, but part of them is our preschool ministry. Yep, that's exactly right. That's you. That's exactly right. I know. Look at that. Everybody's waving back at you. Even people out in the world out there and way out there on the internet, yeah, I know, are waving back at you, okay? So I want you to, there you go, clap for them. We're going to clap ahead of time because they're going to come and serve with you, okay? I love that. That's, that's what it is. So John set, tells us today that we're going to come and serve. So Ross, I'm going to give you back your son. I have been able to pave the way today to minish, make sure that you guys stop by the ministry table to serve. We have a, we have a new hero. We'll, we'll never be able to pull everybody back, I promise you. I want you to introduce you to a young lady. Yesterday, we had our men's breakfast, we, our, and our, we had our ladies' breakfast, or brunch, and we had a group that was on our campus for the second time that I need you to hear about today. So, Danny, would, why don't you come on up here and share with us about this new group? Come on up here. It's not about me because I'm very nervous because of my English, but I hope you guys understand. Um, my name is Danny Taylor, and some of you know me as Miss Danny because I work as a teacher here at the preschool, and um, I'm married with that handsome man there, Steve. And we don't have any kids, but God, be, God bless me with a kids ministry that um, I have all these kids that I take care of like my own. So, but I'm not here to talk about my preschool kids. I'm talking about my Brazilian ministry women's prayer group. So, good morning, everyone. Today, we gather our hearts and voices to celebrate a very special milestone uh, in the history of our Brazilian women's prayer group. Eight years ago, through Pastor Camila Hart, it's a friend of mine, we embarked on a journey of faith and emotional healing, a ministry dedicated to transforming lives through the Word of God. Our mission has been clear from the start, to heal women emotionally so that they, in turn, can go out and heal other women, spreading the love and hope of our Lord. This group has become a true sanctuary where we are um, women, can find support, understanding, and above of all, the transformative presence of God. We want to express our deepest gratitude to you guys, North Reed Church and Pastor David, um, for welcome, welcoming us with open arms and allowing us to use your space here in Haney City. Without this generosity, uh, we would not have been able to start this ministry um, in touching so many lives. You have been more than hosts for us. You have become spiritual partners in this walk of faith. The impact of this group over the years is immeasurable. We have witnessed miracles, personal transformations, and a support network that extends beyond the church walls. As we look to the future, we are filled with hope and excitement. May we continue to be instruments of God's grace, bringing healing and renew to many more women. May this ministry go and bear fruit, always guided by the love of God. To everyone involved, especially you, Northridge friends, and Pastor David, our sincerely thanks. May God continue to abundantly bless each of you, just as he has blessed our prayer group. And this... Um, is a Brazilian shirt for you, ah. from our group to you, um, because like I told you, um, through my faithful eyes, um, I can see maybe in the future, 
We have a Brazilian ministry here in this church. We have an American, we have a Spanish, and maybe in the future we have a Brazilian one. So I ask you guys to pray with me for a Brazilian church here. Ah, <laughs> Thank you so bless much. you, my sister. Amen. Amen. So, let me just tell you. It's okay. I think it's... I'm not cheating on my Americans, girl. I love you. Inspire women. I'm half and a half. God bless you. What was... Amen. Give her another hand, would you? What was so beautiful yesterday is that as we were leaving with our men's ministry, sort of cleaning up, and we had all these ladies coming in, we were having to direct, are you here for the, um, uh, the American service or the Brazilian service? So it was what a neat opportunity. And I believe we are a melting pot in Florida, right? We see that all around us. And I believe it's our responsibility to steward that which God has given to us in a way that would benefit the community the best. You're seeing, matter of fact, I shared with our men yesterday morning, you're seeing an explosion in our Spanish ministry. They're running now between 170 and 180 people almost every week. That room fits about 200. At some point in time, we're going to have to help them to take the next step. And I don't know what that's going to look like. And so I asked our men yesterday, and I would ask you today too, to pray with us because I really believe it's our responsibility to help them and to develop them and because they are part of our, our church family and we look forward to the way they're doing that. But I also pray that God's going to raise up a Brazilian minister. We've got a lot of Brazilians in this, this area as well, right? Amen? Okay, good deal. Well, I look forward to seeing that happening and I believe it's good stewardship. So I'm going to wear, I'm going to put my shirt here on the front today so that you all can be reminded and you can pray for the Bellas. That group is called the Bellas and that you can help us to do that as well. Today is ministry fair, and I, on, the, on the, each table, there's a place for, ser, uh, place for serving. You're saying yes to, you know, there's, there's a place for the media team. You know, there's a group of guys and gals that are in the back back there that usually sit in the dark, and you barely can see them, but there's no way we could make it to a service without that group. There's a media team group back there that would lo they'd love to talk with you after the service today. I'm going to go ahead and move this around for Josh uh, so that at the end of service today, you can also come if you want or are interested in becoming a part of our worship team. There's places for you to serve in our worship team. And Josh and, and the group is going to be here at the front, up on the stage, ready to receive those who may be interested in that. We have... Uh, tables in the back for children's ministry for Awana. Awana meets on Wednesday nights. Children's ministry is basically our Sunday morning ministry. We have groups for OCC. Ed and Barber back there at the OCC table. Operation Christmas Child. While it is a ministry that happens primarily in October, November, it really is a ministry that we focus upon throughout the year. Our, our ladies' ministry, our Inspire table, and that like, Debbie and, and Laura and maybe others will be back in the back today to receive you from that as well to, to talk about what's going on in women's ministry, how that you can be involved. Our outreach team, how many of you all today, and I, I, I'm almost, how many of you all live in this neighborhood next door to us? Okay, we've got a few. And we're, we're a little bit off today, but... And that group, how many of you all received a blanket from our church? Okay, okay, so, some of you. We, ha we made a commitment when, it, when this community first came in that we were going to take a blanket and a, a sort of a welcome bag to the community to let them know that we're glad to be there, uh, them to be a part of our community. I today have a record of those who have been a part or at least visited our church or had some kind of involvement in our church we have a page that's two pages long of families that have actually been here out of this community next door. We are making a difference. That outreach team literally is going and just helping to literally walk up the door and say, I've got a gift for you. Welcome to the community. Uh, Non-threatening way to be able to share. So if you have an interest, maybe your gift is evangelism. You'd like to share. Our prayer team, we meet together on Wednesday nights, but there's a lot of other parts of that prayer team. Our youth leadership team is out there as well. Uh, events, 
all kinds of events takes place. Baptism team, we still need another couple or two that will help us in the back. You rarely are ever seen, but you're a tremendous asset to us in the back so that Jason and Amanda don't have to do that all the time. Our funeral meal team, my goodness, when we lose a loved one, we need somebody to be able to come alongside and love on us while that's happening. And men's ministry, welcome ministry, our greeters, people who, ha- who, sh- who welcome people at the doors, it's, there's a lot happening out there. And I said to the first service this, and this is the way it sort of happens. Maybe today you're here and you'll say, Pastor, I looked around and I see all this stuff happening, but I've got a dream. And maybe you want to come and share that dream with me. And this is where, this is where that conversation is going to go. You're going to say, I've got a dream that I'd like to see. And I'm going to say, great, sounds like a great idea. Are you willing to lead it? And you're going to say, well, I ain't thought about that, but sure. And I'm going to say, welcome, you're it. Tell me how we can help you. Because I really believe that most of the best, best ministry opportunities happens out of the heart of the people of the church. And so if we can come alongside you and help you to be able to accomplish that, we would love to do that as well. Uh, there's so much happening, and God's seeking to do so much in our community and around us, and we look forward to everybody being a part of the serving ministry of the church because we are here to what? I know it's easy for us to come and sit. I understand that. That's the, that's the easy part. But I really believe God has so much more for you involved if you will just take an opportunity to come and share and serve with us. Matthew chapter 5 is our text today. I hope you have your Bibles with you today. You'll find in, the past, find in your Bibles that text or in your technology device, whatever it is maybe you'd be, you would have with you today. I want you to find Matthew chapter 5. We will be looking over Romans chapter 8 a little bit also, but let's focus our attention on Matthew chapter 5 this morning. You know, you've heard the statement, you are what you... And I shared this in our first service this morning, and I, I don't share this out of any kind of thing except just by... Shame, I suppose. I'm getting ready to start one of those four-letter word things. Diet is always a four-letter word. I've put on a little weight, and I'm beginning to tell it in some parts of my body, particularly my back. It hurts a lot. And uh, I lost some weight earlier uh, last year and been able to do really well and somehow or another through the whole thing of life. I know what's happened. But through the whole thing of life, I found myself having put some of that weight back on. And I'm going to choose starting Wednesday of this week will be my target day for starting this four-letter word thing. And uh, this morning as I was driving into church, there was one thing running through my mind. Oh, how sweet it would be to just chew down on a honey bun. It doesn't have to be good sweets. It just has to be sweet. Uh, There's something inside of me that I find that yearning there, but this is what I know. When I eat junk food, it's not good for me. But let me ask you a question. How many of you all enjoy junk food? Look at there. That's more the same same first service. Everybody, my goodness, what what a crowd. We never have that kind of agreement. (laughs) It's awesome. But most of us love junk food. The problem is, is when we eat junk food, you know, you ever ever had one of those times where you got ready for a meal and you thought, I'm going to have a little snack before the meal? You ever had that? And then you get time for the meal and when you get ready to eat the meal, you're not really hungry because you've already had your snack. Sometimes in our lives it's that way, but I I think there is a spiritual parallel to that as well for us. And this is where our focus will be upon, upon the passage that we have before us today. I think, I fear too often in our lives that we are so oftentimes living in such a way that our stomachs are full, but our hearts are empty. And I believe it's just in the same kind of way of eating junk food on a physical level. If we continue to feed on the junk of this world, 
we'll leave little place for the things that we ought to be feeding on in the spiritual realm of our lives. And really that's the context that we have before us, set before us in the passage today with, with your Bibles open, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1, as we've been reading through the Beatitudes, if you'll join with me once again. Now when he saw the crowds, he, be, he went up on a mountainside and sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who, those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. We talked about that last week. Today we'll be focusing our attention upon verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be what? Filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let me jump in, if I can, to our text this morning and really ultimately into our notes today. Uh, and uh, let's, let's just take an opportunity, if we can, as I read this passage of Scripture, we're called to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Therefore, we need to be reminded, number one in your notes, I believe there is a potential for righteousness to be able to be acquired. Or else we would have never been told to hunger and thirst for it. We would never be told by God to pursue something that was, in, that, was, that, that was not attainable. So in reality, there is a potential for us to be able to see or be able to experience, to be able to know or experience and live out this righteousness that he's called for. However, when God looks down from heaven, matter of fact, if you were to look at Romans chapter, 10, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, it's really a quote from Psalm chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. But listen to the psalmist as he... As, as the psalmist talks about God's uh, observation of the world, listen to what it says. The Lord looks down from heaven. You do know that the Lord sees everything, right? It's obvious to us. We need to know that. We need to be aware that, that God sees all things, that the Lord looks down from heaven, and he looks down from heaven upon all mankind. How, ma how, much, man how much of mankind? All of us. None of us are excluded. God sees us all. God looks down from heaven on all mankind, and this is what he does, to see if there are any of the all who understand or any of the all who seek after God. So he looks down from heaven, looks, observes, looks around, takes careful notice of everyone in order that he might be able to see if there's anyone who really understands or anyone who really seeks after God, and his assumption, his observation, what he sees and recognizes, verse 3, all have turned away. How many is all? Every one of humanity has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. So when we consider our life and consider the potential that God is asking us to pursue after or to hunger and thirst after, his observation of all of humanity simply tells us that we don't, we don't measure up. But let me mention two or three things as I think about this passage that I think be helpful for us to grasp. Number one, or letter A in your notes is this, man's best is not good enough. As we look at life and as we pursue life and as we try to, to better ourselves, you know, I believe sometimes in our world, and I, I really think that happens even among Christian folks, that we, we believe that somehow or another that if we can simply work hard enough to make up the difference of our occasional failure, somehow or another we'll measure up. We'll, we'll, we'll make it. How many times have we been by maybe by the bedside of someone who's grieving and Someone who's struggling maybe with the loss or getting ready to be loss of someone. And I, I've been there so many times. And, and, and they're, they're, they're gathered around Aunt Sally. And Aunt Sally, you know, has been a good lady all of her life. And, 
And I, I've heard this conversation even from church people sometimes. You know if there's anybody ever going to be in heaven, it's going to be Aunt Sally because she was the best of the best. The equation somehow or another our mind is, is that somehow or another that we can measure up. But the scripture is very clear that we don't have the capacity to measure up. I, Isaiah 64 verse 6 reminds us of this in, 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 in a clear detail. And this is what Isaiah says. All of us, how many is all? All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous acts, in other words, how much of our righteous acts? Every one of us with every one of our righteous acts are like, here's Isaiah word, Isaiah's words, filthy rags. As graphic as it is, he says, our best effort in life are like the menstrual rags just to be thrown away. And we've all been shriveled up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sin sweeps us away. So man's best effort is simply not good enough. Let me say secondly, the reason that is, is because man's state at best is a state of depravity. There's something inherent within us because of who we are that, that brings us to a place that we are incapable of being able to measure up. And that's this issue of depravity. That's a big word, sometimes a biblical word that we don't quite understand. But what we need to grasp is this, that absolutely everything about you and I has been affected by sin. Why? I mean, Aunt Sally was a good person. She was a great person most of her life. I don't ever remember seeing anything that she ever did wrong. But the context of the scripture remind, reminds us for the, from the front to the very end that we are born into sin. We born, we're born with a sin nature and hence every part of our being has been corrupted because of it. We are completely depraved, incapable of bringing ourselves or raising ourselves or somehow or another measuring up enough to be able to bring about this place of righteousness that God demands from us. Ephesians chapter 2 gives us a little bit of insight as to why that is or what's taking place or what's happened to us, starting in verse 1. And he writes to the church at Ephesus, and he's writing out to the congregation. He could be writing to us today. And it could be very same thing could be said of us. As for you... Meaning every one of us, as for every one of us, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, in which you used to live uh, when you followed the ways of this world and lived underneath the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived that way at one time. But God did something in us, according to Ephesians 2, he has made us alive with Christ to remind us for it is by grace that you have been and that not of, your, not of yourselves, through, say through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any of us would what? Boast. What we have been called to do to measure up is impossible apart from Christ doing it for us. Because we are living in a state of depravity. We've all been affected by the sin nature. You look back at your, child, your children, raising your children. That, that ch child, child, child rearing is a wonderful thing, right? It really is. We learn a lot as parents to raise children. If we're not real careful, we'll learn enough that when we look in the mirror, we'll actually, or when we look at our children, we'll actually see us living out in them, Right? You know, I remember mom used to say, one of these days, God's going to give you a, God's going to give you a child just like you. <laughs> and he did. He sure did. God's got a great sense of humor. But anyway, but the reality is when we look at our children, especially in those younger years, did you ever teach, teach your child to lie or to steal or to be selfish? We don't ever do that. They do that by nature. 
naturally. Why did they do that? Because inherent within all of us, even the best of our children, as cuddly and wonderful as they are, there's a sin nature within them as there are in us, and that affects every part of our being. That brings us to letter C in your notes. While we live in a state of depravity, righteousness is not something that we accomplish. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness as if we could fi figure it out, fix it ourselves, it's not something that we accomplish, but rather that it's imparted to us, yet we are called to pursue it. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who knew no sin. Who's that? Jesus. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God has imputed to us, imparted to us, when, in a, when, we, when this relationship with Christ began, he has imparted to us the righteousness of Christ. All of our bucket of sin that we have in our life, one of these days we're going to have an opportunity to stand before God, every one of us. Philippians 2 is very clear about that. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody. And we're all got, a, we're all got our buckets of sin. We do. But the scripture teaches us very candidly and very clearly that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross his blood was shed on Calvary's cross in order that he might pay the penalty for my sin. And when by faith I accept Christ to be my personal Savior, God imparts to me, take, forgives me, takes away the sin, and imparts to me the righteousness of Christ as he puts the robe of Christ sort of over us so that one of these days when we stand before God, though we all still have this bucket of sin that we've been a part of in our life, we stand before God as a righteous son or daughter of God, not because we've deserved it, but because Jesus, gave, God gave it to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he has imparted to us that which we could not accomplish ourselves. Hence, Romans 8, 1, I would encourage you, if you have your Bibles, just turn over there with me. I want you to hang on to that passage if you would for just a moment or two longer we'll come back to it in just a minute but verse one says this and most of us know this verse maybe even by heart therefore there is now no what condemnation to those who are in Christ why verse two because through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit who get, who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death for what the law was powerless to do. In other words, God, it's God's instruction through Moses, the law and everything else that's been added to it, we can work everything out, do everything as best that we possibly can. The law of the, the, law of the flesh was an, an unable to bring us to a place of righteousness because sin has mingled into our life. We cannot overcome that. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, the sinful flesh. Remember the rich young ruler that came before Jesus? And he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, here's, here's, here's you know, don't commit adultery, don't do this. Don't. He gave him a whole list of the parts of the law. And the rich young ruler said, well, my goodness, if that's all it is, I, I, that's good. I've done that since my birth. Jesus brought him to the place where he really understood his weakness. And he said, I'm, I, I'm glad that you've done that since your birth. But there's one thing you lack. You need to take all that you have, sell it, and give it to the poor, and then you'll have eternal life. The rich young ruler so that's a price too high for me to pay and walked away, right? He assumed that he could keep the law and be able to make his way there. What Jesus taught him and teaches us also is that the flesh has destroyed any capability of you and I being able to make our way to God. We cannot accomplish righteousness because you and I are sinners by birth 
and really sinners by choice as well. But God has imparted to us righteousness for what the law was powerless to do, verse 3, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering and so that, so that he condemned the sin in the flesh, verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law may be met in us who do not live according to the flesh but rather according to the spirit. So there is, a, there is the potential that we find there Not that we can fix it ourselves, but the potential when we come to the place of emptying ourselves and allow Christ to be our personal Savior, that God imparts to us righteousness that we could not do for ourselves, and therefore we're made right with God. And yet, Scripture says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So I believe we need to take that one step further. We need to understand something of the power of hunger. That's point number two in your notes. The power of hunger. Who hunger and thirst for righteousness righteousness you know when we look at this passage of scripture I don't believe we really understand hunger in our country we we really don't we we don't understand what it really means to be hungry for us hunger probably looks a lot like this we have to wait 10 extra minutes for the biscuit to get done or maybe we might sense it as the sensation that we get in our stomach a little bit that we stop that that pushes us to drive by McDonald's and pick up a hamburger and a Coke before we get home. But we've never understood starvation. Our problem is probably that we're not eating too little, but we're really eating too much. And yet the writer of Proverbs 16, 26 says, the laborer's appetite works to benefit him. For it is his hunger that drives him on. There's something inside of us that drives, that is natural and good and fitting, that drives us to get up in the morning and work hard. And that that appetite is a good thing. And yet he tells us in his word, Jesus says that, that appetite, that hunger needs to be for righteousness. Uh, Let's look at this if we can. Going back to Matthew chapter 5, if you would please, real quickly. Matthew chapter 5. He tells us in verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If we were to jump down to verse 10, we see the fourth beatitude and the eighth beatitude sort of wrapped up together. You put these two together. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. We might understand it to say this. We're to hunger and thirst for a kind of life that will cause people to persecute us because of our faith. But if we carry on just in this same passage in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, verse 20, he would tell us this, that that the righteousness that we're to pursue has to be uniquely different than that of Pharisees. Verse 20 says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers, you will certainly never enter the kingdom of heaven. Their their life, they were professional at making their lives do and and act upon that which was right and fitting. But it wasn't enough. Chapter 6, verse 1, if you go one just a little bit further, he tells us in this whole passage, he says, be careful that you do not use your righteous acts of righteousness to be done before men so that people can celebrate and clap for you for the good things you've done. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. The Pharisees love to pray in public. There are long, lengthy prayers. They love to give and their, 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 their coins into their metal containers so they clanged and make, made a lot of noise as they fell in. They love to be able to be celebrated for what they were doing. And yet he tells us, if you were to go just one little bit further in chapter 6, verse 33, and you probably know this verse as well, maybe by heart, he would tell us that We're to seek after his kingdom and his righteousness. And the rest of the world, the rest of the stuff that we're longing for in life will simply be added to us because we've set our priorities in a proper order. There's the power of hunger. The problem number three in your notes is we've got a problem with our appetites. I've got a problem with my appetite. We've got a problem. I don't think that the real problem for most of us 
is that we're suffering from some kind of spiritual malnutrition. I think the problem is, is that we're finding ourselves feeding on the wrong things so that when it comes time for spiritual development, that we no longer have room to fill up that which was, should be empty. Sort of like this. Ladies, you've probably come to a place in your life somewhere along the way and you've prepared this great meal. It could be our guys. You know, you fixed a big steak dinner and you've got everybody, the baked potatoes and everything, salad and everything's out there and everybody's ready to chomp down and eat, you know, and, and you set it all on the table. Everything's absolutely perfect and you invite everybody to the table and when they come to the table, they're all sort of sitting there going, I'm not really hungry. Why are you not hungry? But you didn't notice that they'd got to the cookie jar before they actually come to the table. You see, they filled themselves up on the things that were not good. So when it came time to eat, there was no room for that which was good and fitting and right. Proverbs 27 verse 20 says it this way. Death and destruction are never satisfied and neither are the human eyes. There's a... There's an insatiable appetite within all of us that craves and yearns, and that appetite is put there by God. We're going to talk about that in just a moment, but the problem is so often is we feed ourselves on the things that are not fitting in order to fill an appetite that God has placed on the inside. That's why John said in 1 John 2, verses 15 and following, don't love the world or anything of the world. If anyone loves the, loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything of the, the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father but from the world. The problem is, is we've got an appetite. The problem is, is I've got an appetite and I yearn for a honey bun. Doesn't have to be a good sweet, just a sweet, right? I've got an appetite. But if I feed my life on the wrong things, I physically harm my body. If I feed my spirit on the wrong things, I will physically harm and make a detriment to my spirit. But let me see one further if we can. There's a promise of fulfillment in the scripture. The scripture says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied or they shall be filled. There's a passage in Ecclesiastes 3 that I use quite often as I'm wrapping up a, a, a funeral message. And it's sometimes it's there. I, I do this because the reality is there's so many times in life, the only times people will ever come to church anymore is for a funeral. We don't even come for weddings most of the time anymore, but they will come for a funeral from occasionally. And I feel like I've got a small opportunity, a small window to capture their attention. And I'll oftentimes come to Ecclesiastes 3. Verse 10 says this, for God makes all things beautiful in what? His time. Some of you know that. For God makes all things beautiful in his time. We don't oftentimes go beyond that. Verse 11 says, for God has placed within the hearts of humanity this thing called eternity. Why would God put in the heart of mankind eternity? Well, if we theologically, we can go back and Adam and Eve were created and humanity was created to live eternity, eternally. So we could sort of say that. I believe that's, that, that could be part of it. When one of these days when we physically die we die because sin is entered into a life when we physically die we're going to uh, literally get to a place where we don't end our existence we simply take the next step into our existence because God has created to us created us et as eternal beings and because of the choices we've made with Jesus we'll either we'll either transition to a place where we'll spend the rest of eternity with God in heaven or we'll transition to a place where we'll spend the rest of eternity in a place called hello okay want to make sure we're still there 
But I don't think that's what he's talking about there in Ecclesiastes 3.10. I think what he's talking about there is that Ecclesiastes 3.10, God has placed inside of the human heart something that the temporal things of this world can never satisfy. So we run through life and we try to find this stuff. We work harder in order to get more, more things. We, we do more vacations. We do whatever it is in life. We play more golf, we, you know, whatever it possibly may be. I don't know all the things that we may do in life to try to satisfy the inner yearning and longings of our life. But at the end of the day, nothing can ever satisfy what God has placed in there because the only thing that will ever satisfy that longing is a relationship with Jesus Christ. God placed it in there to drive us to always be looking for something more. And at funeral times, I often take that opportunity to say that something more may simply be for you a relationship with Jesus Christ. How about you today? Have you ever met him to be your personal savior? Maybe today the fulfillment you're looking for in life is not something that you'll ever accomplish on this side of eternity. Maybe the fulfillment you're looking for and what you need in your life is simply a relationship with Jesus. And today that's possible for you today. So that brings us point, I think, to the next point in our notes, and that's the possibility. The possibility. For every one of us to hunger and thirst after the things of righteousness, to live in the possibility of the potential, the potential that God has placed for us that we cannot accomplish ourselves, and yet God has given it to us as a possibility for us to live. Yes, we have been imparted righteousness in our life because of a relationship with him, but he's called to us to pursue that. And so in so doing, we hunger and thirst for it. And I would just simply go, we could take the Sermon on the Mount and we're going to be doing that in the months to come. But if we can take the Sermon on the Mount and go a little bit further back in Matthew chapter 5 and or Matthew chapter 6 particularly, and if you would pick up with me in verse 19, Matthew 6, 19. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust are stored, where thieves break in and steal. The tendency of humanity is we, we want to store ourselves up. We got all kinds of stuff. You know, isn't it amazing? And you know, around it, it is amazing how many storage units are being built. We have storage units to store our stuff that we don't have, time, don't have places in our homes to keep our stuff. They're getting ready to build a, a big storage unit right across the street here. And if I, if I understand correctly, it's going to be one of those high-rise ones so that you can store a bunch more stuff in there. Isn't that great? Don't store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth does break in and, and destroy, but rather store for yourselves What? Treasures in heaven where moths and vermin cannot destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your... Boy, that's a hard word to stomach, is it not? Well, how could I determine where my heart is other than with my stuff? Verse 22, very next verse. Context. The eye seems like it's a different concept, but it's not. The eye, it's the thing that we observe, the world around us. It's the, he calls it here in verse 22, the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are healthy, your, your whole body's full of light. He's, he's not talking about glaucoma or some other eye disease. He's talking about that which we're looking for. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. In the same kind of way, as we eat junk food in our life, if we pursue with sight that which is not edifying to the spirit, our whole body is going to be affected by it. And if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Then we get this statement, no man can serve two masters. You'll either hate the one and love the other. Wow, what a statement. And then, then the context goes to verse 30 or 25, which is where we mentioned a while ago in verse 33 is in that context. 
He says, so therefore I don't tell you about, don't worry about today or tomorrow, your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Isn't life more than food, the body more than clothes? But look how he, look at the words that's used here, verse 26. Take notice, look at, gaze at the birds of the air. They don't fret. They don't worry about, they don't store up their stuff in barns or storage units. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Verse 28, and why don't you, why, don't worry about your clothes, what you wear. See, notice, look, take notice of the flowers of the field that grow. They don't labor or spin, yet Solomon, all of his glory was never, never arrayed in such splendor. Verse 31, so don't worry about saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows you and he knows what you need. Verse 33, but rather, here's that word again, seek. Set your focus first on his kingdom and his righteousness and all the stuff that you think you need will be taken care of. Let me wrap up with a couple of statements. Maybe I hope today we can do that today. I don't think that the problem with humanity today is some kind of spiritual malnutrition. It's I simply think that we've eaten so much junk that we don't have room for the things of God. I'm reminded back with Jesus, you remember Mary and Joseph taking off that trip to Bethlehem? Uh, you know, the, there's a statement in that whole thing that just really rocks my world. When he got to the innkeeper, you know what? What did the innkeeper say? There is no room. I wonder today how much space we have reserved in our life for God and the things of God. I, I, I don't think that we're struggling from spiritual malnutrition. I think we've eaten enough junk that we don't have enough room for God spiritually. Could it be, here's your notes statement, could it be that the real experience of most people today is that they have full stomachs and yet empty hearts? I wonder. When we find ourselves Dominate. Romans 8, 5. Those who are overcome, dominated, controlled by the flesh, the sinful nature. Are not thinking about spiritual things. But rather those who are controlled by the spirit. Think about the things that please the spirit. Let me, let me give you a, a, an Indian proverb today. It's equated, I think, to the Cherokee, and I, I, I'm not real sure. Sometimes you hear, th hear things, and so I'm going to credit it to that which I received it as. So I'm going to credit it to the Cherokee Indian. One evening, there was an old Cherokee leader that was talking to his grandson, about the stuff that goes on inside of humanity. And he said to his grandson these words, My son, the battle on the inside is really between two wolves that are inside of every one of us. One of those wolves is evil, anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, Guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superior, uh, superiority, and ego. That's one of the wolves, he said. The other wolf with inside of us is good. It's that of joy and peace and love and hope and serenity and humility and kindness and benevolence, empathy and generosity and truth and compassion and faith. And the story says that there was a pause in the conversation and the young man began to think and ponder 
And this is the question after a moment or two of ponder that he asked his grandfather. And this is the question. Granddad, which wolf wins? And the old Cherokee simply stated, it's the wolf that you feed. And I really think in our culture today, we feed the wrong things. We feed our spirit the wrong things. It's not that we're suffering from malnutrition. I think our stomachs are full, and I fear our hearts are empty. So the question I think that, that looms before us is this. What will you choose to feed today that will create for you a hunger in the days to come. I've told you, I've got this real problem with sweets. And I say it tongue in cheek many times because there's probably a, one or two of you all that share that same problem with me. But here's what I know, having been on this four-letter word previously, this is what I know. It doesn't take me long to take sweets out of my diet that two things pretty quickly take over. Number one, my pain begins to go away. I, I don't understand that. There will be those who are in the medical profession. Talk to Michelle. She could tell you that. But I guess sweets does something to us that causes inflammation to happen in our body and most of our pain comes from inflammation and I've got, I've got a fair amount of it that is resident in my back most of the time. And I know that. If I just take sweets out of my diet, it's not long before the pain begins to go away. Number two is this. If I take sweets out of my diet, it's not long before... I no longer have a hunger for them either. But I'm like an alcoholic in the fact that it only takes one honey bun to set it in motion. So I want you to hear me say from your pastor today, back up that last slide if you would please. I've got to make a choice as to what I'm going to feed. And whether we feed our bodies nutritionally good things or not, eternity doesn't hang in the balance with that. But eternity hangs in the balance for what we choose to feed our bodies spiritually. Let's think about it, can we? Let's pray. Let's stand together, please, as we pray. Lord Jesus, we pause today again to say thank you again for the privilege that we have as your children to be able to open up your word and allow your word to peel back the parts of our being that we, hmm, we may rather not look at and yet you desire us to see. So I pray, oh God, today in the midst of this journey, in the midst of this life, as we continue to pursue this whole concept of what it means to be a follower of Christ and the character that you're seeking to develop within us, an empty of spirit, emptiness of spirit, a grief over our own sin state and the state of the sin around the world, an opportunity to be able to come to a place of meekness, to have our lives moldable and yet strong. And yet today you've also called us that this central, central point, I think, to look within because it really in many ways is dependent upon what we choose to feed ourselves on. Draw us to yourself, we pray. Give us courage to understand our shortcomings and to see them as you see them 
give us boldness to be able to address those matters and to make some choices today and in the days to come that will make eternity different for us that will set us on course for spiritual success for hearts being filled with the Spirit of God and finding real satisfaction where satisfaction was intended to be so bless us today as we seek to think through work through listen to you as you seek to draw us to yourself we pray in Jesus name